Hello everyone, welcome to the SNC podcast, a show helping you better understand the intriguing world of music, arts and entertainment through insightful discussions with African artists, creatives, executives and entrepreneurs. I am your host Fola Shade Anozie. My guest today is Adiola Akimola, an entrepreneur based in Lagos, Nigeria. At the age of 19, she dropped out of university to start her food business, Corporate Ewa, an in-demand virtual restaurant showcasing the versatility and variety of beans as a meal. Her virtual restaurant serves customers across various locations in Lagos, Nigeria. Adiola is also a programmer and business manager with over three years experience selling solutions and developing new business areas. Hello Adiola. Hi. hi. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much. You know, you know what's so interesting I feel like about doing a podcast or just doing interviews is that when you send emails back and forth, I feel like you get if you feel like you know the person a little bit. So when you came up when you when I saw you, I was like, oh, <laughs> so, and also thank you for being early i appreciate that you're welcome so how are you doing yeah i'm very fine i'm happy to speak with you because you have such a fascinating background so for people who don't know your background can you just share briefly how you became a food entrepreneur okay thank you very much for asking i'm from a family of four and um i grew up in lagos you know did a couple of works after school, you know, trying to seek admission for a couple of years. And in the process, I got a job at a security firm. And from that security firm, I felt like, okay, I need to go back to school, not really go back to school, but to move away from my parents. And from that time, I was able to get admission into LASU. Getting to LASU, you know, there was no support, nothing. And I needed to make way for myself. And so I sat down scrolling through my socials and was wondering what I could do to, you know, make some money. And then I came across a tweet from a friend. It was just seeking a wagon. And this particular friend was even at um, Edo. So I I saw the tweet and it just brought the inspiration to me. If someone at Edo could be looking for Ewa Goye on Twitter. So how much more people in Lagos? And so I decided to go online, try to search for any brand that actively does that. And I didn't find any. So I saw that this was actually an opportunity I could tap from. And that was how it started. So when you saw that, you now said, hmm, this is going to be an idea for me to start selling Ewa Goye. Yeah. So yeah. what what happened next? Okay, what happened next was how to get money to get started. And at that time, I didn't have anything. I didn't even take anything to school like every other student would. So I just thought, what did I have in my possession at the time? It was my school fee. <laughs> Yikes. Yeah, it was my school fee. And so I'm someone that when I want something, I just go for it. So I, the consequences might not be something I would put my mind so much on at that moment. And so I just told myself I was going to start. I took the school fee, went to the markets. You know, I went through YouTube and a few others to see what do I need. Because I, my parents were not people that make it while going before. It was just something I came about along the lines. You understand? So I just took the money, went to the market. I was... Lasso is in them. Um, I went to Lasso. Lasso is at um, Yanoba, and then I went to a market at Yanokwaja, still within the same area. And then I bought all that I needed. I bought small beans. I bought small pepper. Bought some packs, and that was how I started. I did it that day. It was messy, but I took a picture of it with my techno phone, and then I posted online. Wait, so you know how to cook, right? Um, normal family food <laughs> cooking. That was what I was doing back. So how did you know how to make it go? You How did you learn how to make the ewa going for on that particular day? Or was it, had you made it before? So I didn't make the popular ewa going then. What I did was just what I thought was ewa going. I didn't get it. But what I now did after is I did a few trials, trials, first day, second day, third day. But one thing is um, the first one I made was not good. However, I still posted it, got a few persons to order, and then I delivered it to them like that. It was messy. I didn't need to be told it was messy. But the second day, I tried again, third day. So later, I realized that YouTube and, you know, all of those social media, what they were portraying as a wagoy was actually not the way it was made. 
So what I now did was I got onto the street and, you know, tried to speak to a few sellers, those orcas, and try to see if there was anyone who was willing to, you know, teach me. I saw one, you know, these people, they, they cherish their knowledge a lot and they would not want to give out their secret. But I was eventually able to get someone that was willing to teach me. I think she taught me for, was it, I paid her 5K or 10K or thereabouts, the, the woman. She taught me, put me through and um, I did it. I was able to get it. After a while, I saw that I wasn't getting the result I was targeting. I had to use the same method, look for, you know. And the way I approach them is this, I buy from them first. After I buy from them, then, you know, we try to get along. And after that time, I try to tell them, okay, please give me your number. There's something I want to discuss with you. After which we just get into the conversation. So if they say yes, fine. If they say no, fine. I move on to the next person. So first of all, you paying the lady five five k or ten k at the time. Also, a great reminder that knowledge isn't free. <laughs> you gotta it's pay not. to. You have to it's pay. It's not excel, or, or else they will teach you the fair fair. I mean the the surface level, but you will not get the deep. What is what the secret is? You won't get it. So eventually, did you now get the proper recipe? Yeah, I got it. I got it after learning from three different Togolese women. Togolese women. Yeah, wow. so I didn't just learn from the regular, you know, anybody. I learned from people that were from Togo. And even up to date, all the people that work with me that cook the meals, they are from Togo. Wow. What, what is it about Togolese? Are they, is, that where, is that where our going is it's from? It's originated from um, Togo. Oh. Even the Agoyin itself is, is the name of the particular people that make the beans. So fascinating. <laughs> I don't even really. It's, I, I've never really had Ewa going, you know. So yeah. this is so fascinating. The most I've, uh, the closest thing I've had to Ewa going is Obedindi. <laughs> so, but okay. So when business began to pick up, how did your parents react? Because obviously you use your school fees. Okay. Firstly, I my father is late. He's been late since like since right up right before i even finished secondary school so it was it's just my mom the thing is the money was my money because it was the money i saved from working as a security operative and um i didn't tell her outrightly in fact she got to know after i had done it for like six months so i didn't tell her that i was going no nobody no parents no sibling would see i mean it doesn't make any sense at the beginning so, yeah, I didn't tell my parents. It was over time. They knew there was nothing and I needed a way to support myself. And so, yeah, we had no choice. Yeah, wow. So, did you have to drop out of school? Yeah, I did. Wow. <laughs> have you, did you, did you go back to finish your degree? Yeah, I'm currently running on a distant program. Okay. Yeah. Now, that's, that's amazing. See, it's, that's, I feel like sometimes people don't really grasp the sacrifices that come with being successful. And like you said, going for what you want and quote and unquote damning the consequences yeah. but there are consequences that come with pursuing what you love and what you're passionate about so that's just i, I wish you the best of luck in getting that degree i mean <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing Thank so you. you now you are selling the things from school and you're advertising on social media from what you have explained yes, right yes at any point in time did you consider having a full-scale restaurant like a physical um, place people could come and buy. Because what you do with Corporate Ewa, which is the name of your brand and the business that you run, is you ha it's a virtual kitchen. Yeah. You People don't come to eat in the no, place. They, they order and then you, they order. Either they, you take it there or they come and pick it up, right? Yes, yes. At any point in time, did you consider having a full-scale restaurant? Did that ever cross your mind? Okay, I would say I actually owned one. I owned one in the past and then I saw that that was a mistake. It was a very terrible mistake. I think it was six months after I started in 2020. I I wanted the income to be consistent. If you have ever sold anything online, you understand that every day is not payday. You could sell today and tomorrow it's like lesser or you don't at all. So I wanted something that would be consistent and so I felt maybe if if i had a walk-in where people could come in to eat and you know sit down and all of that and that would change so i think around um october i opened the physical place within the student environment you know advices here and there i opened the physical space branded it and it was so fancy people came but i saw that the people within the area were not my target audience because what they wanted in the area was the regular thing they get around 50 there a spoon of beans 100 a spoon of beans and all of that so when we started when i started operating that restaurant we were selling 
a plate of, you know, ewagoyere bread for 300 and they still had difficulty buying it. Did they feel like it was too expensive? Or? Yeah, for the environment. For because the environment. when you look at environments, it has a lot of influence on the business. So looking at the environment, it doesn't even matter to them if at the end of the day, the scoop they get when they buy 50, 50 naira own is the same thing they will get if they get it. But the fact that you have tacked it, you know, 300 naira, they, they would rather go and buy the one they would buy and 50, 50 naira. And aside that, we branded the place in a way that it, it was not welcoming to them. It was giving them the, the belief that it was expensive. When and your they, butter vibes. Uh, do you understand? <laughs> so that was it. So we couldn't keep up. I knew that, yeah, this was not definitely going to work. Okay, so obviously you close it down and just stuck to just yeah, being a virtual kitchen. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Now in terms of, I want to just quickly talk about business registration. How did you go through that process, you know, registering the business as well as, you know, finding it, I mean, okay, you talked about the fact that you had a physical location but you had to close it down because I wanted to talk about finding a location because from what I saw on Twitter, your business is in Surulere. Okay. The business has operated from about three different locations okay. now. Okay. It started up from um, started off from um, Yanoba, which was where Lasu was. From there, I moved to Ikeja at a rented kitchen. From Ikeja, we moved to I moved to Sirulere. It was after Ikeja that I saw that I needed to actually move totally away from Lasu, and that was when I dropped off Lasu. So from Ikeja, I moved to Surulere. I was living, I was doing it from my own house then. And from that place, we moved to a location. We, we were able to rent a you know, mini flat to work from. And from that mini flat, we currently work with the full, a, a full building at Surulere. That's fantastic. What about business registration? How did you go about doing yeah. that process? Okay, we registered the business, I think, um, since 2020, December. I knew that. For you, if if you if you always see the bigger picture of something, then you should. There's a way you have to authenticate it. You have to show that yes, this is this is working. And so the registration was done. Um, I think it was done since December 2020. And then last year, I saw that yeah, this is something I need to trademark. Did the trademark as well, and you know that was it. No, that's um, that's amazing because I feel like a lot of times, and it's a valid point though. A lot of people say that I want to start a business, but I don't even have money for registration. I don't even, I don't even have money for trademark and all of that. And I guess because you had the resources and you made a valid point about the fact that if you take something seriously you would put in the effort and the work that is required. So registering the business and yes. doing the trademark. Yes. Was it a lawyer that advised you or you just thought about it by yourself? Okay, for the registration, it's. I think it was just a... Basically, I looked and you need your you business did your research yeah. but for trademark i saw that i was i wanted to grow um we want to go global and first thing to do is you have to secure the name the name corporate is already out there and there's there's need for an extra layer of security and so that was why i that was when we did i i spoke to a lawyer a law, i have a friend as a lawyer who has been working with me since like we started the business so i spoke to him and he did all of the process and then yes we got the trademark now why the name corporate ewa Okay, so <laughs> I never wanted to be a business person gr growing up. I wanted to be the type that, you know, wear my suit, wear my stiletto, and then go to the office, blah, blah, blah. And then when I saw that the business world was just <laughs> what I found myself in, I felt like, okay, I wanted to target the corporate audience. I didn't want to target the, I wanted the middle class and the upper class. Upper class. And so I, how do I basically corporate world? I wanted to target the corporate world. And so that is where the corporates came in. And then the AY is from AY going. So that, that is just how the name. Really simple. And for people who are listening, I should definitely let you explain what AY going is. For people okay. are like, what does that even mean? Or what, is, what does that taste like? Okay. So AY going is an African dish made with um, beans. It's just beans. However, what makes it different from the regular beans is the method of preparation. Because with the method of preparation, it makes the beans very soft, like very, very soft. And then the sauce is specially prepared. It is not prepared like the regular stew sauce and all pepper sauce and all. It is, it is regularly prepared with its own recipe. So that's what makes it special. Do you understand? So it's just um, beans and they are going sauce. 
Did the Togolese women who taught you talk how the how the beans came to play? Because you know there's some dishes that you hear about, and it came from a place of people not having a lot of things to eat, yeah. and it was just mix and match. So in the process of them teaching you about how to prepare the dish, did they by any chance share with you how? You mean the history? Yeah, the history. Yes. Yeah, so. No. No. Okay. They never did actually. Oh, okay, yeah, I should probably ask them. It just it would be interesting to <laughs> All I've heard so far was it was just like a when when it becomes a family business and then the family grows into a large community and all. So that was just all they said about it. Well, hopefully you do more research about that. <laughs> what about in terms of finding clients? Because you okay. talked about the fact that for corporate era you were targeting the middle class and yeah. the upper class. Yeah. How did you go about finding these people? Okay, considering that we, I have always had limited resource, the social media is my tool, is, is my resource, is, is that capital for me to bank on. So I've always used social media heavily to drive traffic. And it's easier for me to get across to 50,000 persons with just, you know, maybe 30K ad or let's say 20K ad. But it's it's going to be very difficult for you to do a physical walk and try to connect to 50,000 persons. And the kind of pe- people I'll connect with if I do a physical walk within my community is different from the kind of people I can access with social media. We've delivered to a number of celebrities. In fact, I cannot name them all. If it were you know, physical and all of that, I would not have access to them. But with social media, I bank on it all the time through ads, sponsored ads, referrals and all of that, you know, we keep pushing ourselves out there on social media. All right, great. Now, what's a typical day like for you at work? Because obviously a typical day, I keep, you know, a lot of times I ask that question and I know that there's no typical day for a lot of people. But for you, Adiola, what is a, okay, let's not say typical, what's a regular day like for you at work? Okay, so let's just say my day daily life a day in the life of Adiola okay I wake up in the morning <laughs> <laughs> go ahead go ahead go ahead I wake up in the morning open my phone to check messages calls mails that's the first thing I pray oh I pray first <laughs> it's okay I pray first and after the prayer, I go on my phone to check if I've missed anything. I check the socials. I check everything to be sure that I'm not missing anything. Also, I check on the staff, the handlers to be sure that we do not have any issue online. You know, all customers are being attended to. And after that, I get to the office, check around. Is everywhere clean? After that, I check the kitchen, spend some time with them to be sure that things are going as they should go in the morning because we have to be sure that by certain time this meal is ready, these orders that has been made, are they out? Speak with the staff and everybody. Once they are out, you know, in the afternoon, I try to take content. I take content from my phone too. I post them out, you know, of course, for others to see. After that, I wait till 5 p.m. so I can go back and sleep. (laughs) No, that's that's pretty. Really, that, that, I love that idea in the life. You touched on the point of reaching out to your staff. Yeah. Now, two questions that I forgot to ask you: How did you find the cooks and the staff? For the staff, did you use a company to find them? And for the cooks, how did you how did you find those people? Okay, I do not use companies. I speak to these people directly. One staff brings the order. That's the way we've always worked. The first staff I had was. To the neighbors, you know, I spoke to neighbors and all of that because we do our things the traditional style. We do not just go and get one chef that went to one fancy English school to cook. No, no offense to <laughs> chefs who do that. Sorry, no offense, but we use the trad. We prepare in the traditional style, and so we need to use these people who prepare it in the traditional style. And so the method to getting them is we speak to. You know, I speak to neighbors, maybe the cleaners, speak to them. Do you know somebody that cooks a certain thing? So when they say they know, invite the person to come and prepare a sample, you know, test the person and all of that. That was how I got the first person. And then the first person, I just told that we needed someone again. And then she spoke to this, 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 this. That is how we've gotten all the people that work with us. That's great. I mean, the cook. Yeah. But when you now talk of the, um, the regular staff, LinkedIn basically okay that's really cool now i saw that you have expanded your menu because corporate ever obviously like you said about beans and it's about showcasing 
from my understanding and your mission, the versatility of what beans can be as a meal, right? Yes. But you have expanded your menu now to from beans specific meals to other African meals, such yeah. as tapioca. I haven't had tapioca in like I saw that I was like, oh that's cool. <laughs> so you expanded to tapioca, you now have jollof rice, yeah. you will now have um white soup. Yeah. Afang soup, yeah. edi kaikon, yeah. and some other types yeah. of dishes. I think I saw one. There's one bean. Is it, uf, is it uf, ekuru? Ekuru, yes. Yeah. You have that too. Now, why did you think it was important to expand your menu to include these other meals? I asked that question because, you know, some businesses want to be known for just yeah. a specific type of dish and they do that really well. But for you, why do you think it was important to expand to other meals? Okay, I think the main reason we did was because I personally, as much as, you know, I do beans, I cannot eat beans Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. So we had some clients that would come to us, do you have this? What else do you have that I can eat? That is not where I'm going. And I do not blame them. It's just normal. You cannot eat the same food every day. So um, we now thought about it. Okay, what else can we give them that doesn't totally take us out of what we are trying to represent, which is basically to promote African food culture. And so we thought of what to include. We started by including meals that are beans related, like moi moi, ikuru, rice and beans we wanted rice but we did not just want <laughs> we wanted to always infuse that beans in our menus and so we, we introduced rice and beans so when we saw that it was already getting enough traction like people wanted it then we thought to ourselves okay now that we have included all of this why not just make it african centric meals so we do not do all of these fancy meals all we just do is the traditional african those indigenous ones those are what we do it's just very interesting because some people when they do that when they expand their menu whether it's a menu or service that they provide they see that they don't achieve the impact that they thought that they were going to um, achieve in terms of financial growth but from your explanation there was a demand for yeah. expanding the meal for expanding your menu to include african-centric meals yeah I, I just i just think that's important as opposed to just waking up one day to say oh i'm going to include something that nobody asked for it's basically to give our clients options they want to stick to us it's i mean we have a kind of you know it's like a community and so when they want it why not give them instead of leaving them to go out there to it's basically that's it that's that's great that's great now, i want to go on to some of the challenges that you have faced running a business in nigeria because it's not easy obviously so one of the challenges that you have faced that i saw online is the issue of pricing yeah. it seems like it's like a it's like a hot topic for people on twitter <laughs> <laughs> and you had mentioned earlier about the fact that your target market was middle class and upper class what is the issue that we have people or not even that we have that people have when it comes to the prices that you charge for the things that this the meals that you provide and just in general as an entrepreneur in nigeria a foodpreneur in nigeria how do you go about finding that sweet spot of not alienating the people that you actually want to have as customers while still giving room for people that may be like hmm let me just possibly try them and see what what the what maybe what the fuss is about. Okay, I I feel like we charge as much as Twitter make it seem like the prices are a lot. When you when you compare it and you know you see the value and everything you tend to get, I do not think it's a lot. It's just right for the value we provide. And for the pricing, I if you as an entrepreneur, if you want to consider the controversies that comes around your pricing to you want controversies to influence your pricing, then I do not think you are ready for the business. Because um, I would talk about when we used to operate a restaurant. Then I was I was still a baby in the business. And so the controversies, the comments and all of that influenced most of my decisions. Whereby, you know, I had to sell cheaply thinking that, okay, maybe this time when I sell cheaply, it's going to get me the traction and the numbers and the all of that that I need. We sold for 15 euro per scoop. I want to say those were days that I actually regret because before you can sell cheaply, you need to be able to get numbers. The only way you can make sense of selling cheaply is to get numbers. 
And do I even have the facility to serve? Look at it, for example. When we sold, we sold for 300 naira per plate in the past. When we sold at that time, we had a number of persons that came to us and wanted to buy because they saw that, oh, she has now reduced her price. <laughs> so they all came and we could not serve them because we had to deliver 300 naira plates to about 50 locations. When you calculate 300 times 50, that should be about um, 15,000. And then you, 15,000 error revenue, but you have to cover 15, um, 50 locations. The logistics of covering 50 locations in Lagos is crazy. And then we were even operating from a location whereby it's, it, was, it had already put us at a disadvantage. If you operate from an extreme location in Lagos and then you are doing food logistics, you are going to have a tough time. So why not just focus on the few who, would, who, who are fine with the pricing and you know you can serve them well rather than trying to chase after the, the crowd and end up disappointing. Do you understand? So that was where I knew that, okay, if at a, we can, you cannot sell to everybody. The market is too big for you to sell to everybody. So now try to get the ones you can serve and serve them right. And then let the, you know, don't, don't, don't kill yourself with the numbers that you're trying to. No, that totally, <laughs> I, lo- I love that. And I think that one of the challenges I have that I observe on not even just social media, in life, generally is that some people think that they're not people who are willing to pay for what they want in the sense that someone sees that and says ah, who is going to pay for example this bag for five hundred thousand dollars but there are people who have the resource to buy yeah. it so i feel like a lot of times people think that everybody's in the same financial bracket that they are in social um, media, <laughs> social media <laughs> creates that kind of bubble they you know we all think that we are I don't know your pocket, you don't know my pocket, but the both of us can just go on social media and act like we are not what we are. So everybody assumes as the, <laughs> despite out of this economy is there are still some people that are doing just fine. It is you that you are struggling. That it's me that is struggling. That it is me that is struggling. That I can relate. <laughs> Let us. I'm in mean, the same bucket. <laughs> okay. So, now yeah. one of the other issues you talked about when I saw on Twitter was about the issue of Omonile. I, oh. I think that that's such a very interesting... Um, can you talk a bit about that? Okay, I think it was this Sierra area. It was really challenging, trust me. Operating in Sierra area has been very, very challenging. As much as it has been a blessing, it has had its challenges, huge ones. When we were at the former location, we had security issues. They were always fighting, always. And so it was a huge challenge Sorry, for fighting us. about what? I mean, there's just always fight <laughs> between those guys, Agbera and everybody. There was always fight. You know, if they are not breaking bottles today, you are like fighting for your life, basically. And so we had to, you know, move from that place. You know, somewhere you spend so much branding, doing all sorts for. And then less than one month, there's the pressing need to move. Because if you don't move, what happens to your staff, customers? Anything can happen to anyone. So the pressure to move came. Searching for place was was like, it was hell. And then you finally find somewhere. It's like the place is not even in the right, like it's not in the right structure and everything is just so terrible. But you still have to go for it because you do not have a choice. The, the available ones are very, very limited. And even the limited ones that are available, you know, there is, there's just the, we don't want food, we don't want this, we don't want that. And then you now find something that at least you can put to your taste and then the money letting came in i didn't buy the house why are you telling me to come and pay this pay that pay this just because i am correcting a world that that is cracking or something do you understand it was a whole lot of challenge and they these guys do not care they cannot build but they can destroy they were just like if one comes today another comes tomorrow oh this is our so so so, so association pay so so money just because they saw that we were doing some you know renovations and it was challenging but actually for our non-nigerian listeners can you explain what omonile is okay omonile are there are people that own the land. They believe they are the indigenous owners of the land. So if at irrespective of the fact that you bought the land with your 
money they believe they have entitlement to the land so when you are building or doing any construction on the land they believe you have to give them something they they are entitled so it's not even like you want to dash them they believe they are entitled to it and if you don't do it they can destroy the place i've heard so many stories about omonilas and i'm just like it is it's wild now it one is. of the challenge that you f- that you face as a food entrepreneur in nigeria is i, I saw you mention about um, dispatch riders eating food that you're supposed to go to. <laughs> I'm like, wait, what? So can you just speak briefly about that? I, you know, there's in this in this business, there's just so much to <laughs> you experience daily. I think I think the the last one was with you know one of those riders carried food. You know, he did. I, I think he did even try to reach the customer. and He claimed the customer was not responding, and he took the food home. Uh. <laughs> Wait, so what was the... Why couldn't they return the food to you, the the, the business? I guess to him, it's easier to eat it after, right? The customer was not responding. How do you deal with generally... I don't even have the words for that, really. How, how do you deal with gener, generally with riders, particularly when you use um, riding companies and they face issues with the government? You know, sometimes the government says, you're going to ban this, or Kada, you're going to ban this. So that's someone who relies on logistics and delivering food to different people. How do you deal with that? I mean, I, I would say that's even like the biggest challenge to e-commerce in Africa as a whole. Logistics is a whole lot. We deal with issues every day. There was a time, I think there was around last year or earlier be- before, the night post fee came up whereby governments um, were charging you know, companies, you would see all the mushroom logistic companies, government charging them as high as 200k levy, you know, to pay and all of those. When, when, when that time came, logistic price increased and getting customers to pay that was difficult. But that's not even the challenging part of it. There are, I, I feel like to even get reliable companies to work with is a challenge. I, I feel like a lot of logistic operators in this Lagos knows me and they hate me. <laughs> Because you're always like calling them out, I'm, I'm because assuming. Because I am always like, I fight for the customers a lot. And in fighting for the customers, I have to deal with the logistic companies that mess up customers' food. And so they all know me. Even they know me that I am. <laughs> a lot of the riders know me too, but at least they know that I would fight for my customers and for, for our business. The business must go on. If you like, do your rubbish, but you must do my work right or I don't pay you. You know, it's very hard in this country to find businesses or people that are committed to excellence. We feel like it's okay for us to do mediocre work and you're supposed to be celebrated. It blows my mind the level of mediocrity and we think that it is like the greatest thing. See, I feel feel like people feel, they think when they do something for you, irrespective of the fact that they have been paid, they feel like you should be grateful for whatever you receive. Which is actually something I would not take. If you want to do me a favor, you better do the favor. But the moment it is a business transaction, a business transaction, you better deliver or we are going to have a problem. So that is basically now this country. <laughs> it, I, I know it is, it's just mind blowing. Now <laughs> let's just move on to something a little bit more, I guess, happier. Because <laughs> Nigeria can drive you crazy as, a, as an entrepreneur, particularly you. with food. Um, there's a growing trend of African foods becoming, people want them to be healthier because they feel like it's, a, it's very oily and there's too much frying and people, not just even the African foods, you also have people who are adopting healthier lifestyles. Yeah. Is that a trend that you are embracing? Because as you know, Ewa going is not necessarily like the healthiest um, meal. Is there a different way that Ewa going can be made healthier? First thing first, we prepare in a very clean environment. And secondly, we have tried to ensure that it's as healthy as possible. Regarding the oil, we do not use the regular granite oil, we use palm oil. And aside that, we now have customers who request for oil on their food to be lesser. And so we try to ensure that the oil in each meal are less. But aside that, I feel like African meals are healthier than we make it to seem because all of the processed meals that that is eaten in the Western world has adverse effects on their health. But when you look at several of African meals, the major challenge that might be posed at it is maybe it's prepared in in a dirty environment or it's too oily. All our meals are basically like fresh from farm. 
the beans, there's nothing like processed canned beans or something. The, what is it called? Um, what else do we eat again? Vegetables, yeah, vegetables. everything. Like, exactly. They are not processed. And if you, if you check carefully, processed foods has um, lots more damage to the health than the naturally grown ones. So I feel like Africa is on the right path. What we just need to work on is the environment in which the meals are prepared and also reduce the oil quantity. For us, particularly, we do not... Funny enough... Ewa going does not even, I, I feel like it's healthier because there is no maggi, the sodium and the, the salt is a lot lesser. And aside that, there is no other thing that is used except natural ingredients. When you talk of beans, you talk of ginger, garlic that are natural. We do not even use the processed ones. We use the seed. So we can say, yes, it's an LD option. Okay. Now, what is the next phase for corporate Ewa? You talked about, you know, you expanded your meals to accommodate clients who are customers who are asking you for more things. You still run a virtual kitchen, but let's just say the universe aligns and you get this ton of money to do whatever it is that you want. Do you do you eventually want to have a full scale kitchen or are you just going to go with that virtual kitchen? OK, we do not have it in our plan to have a walk in kitchen. No, it's, it's not part of the agenda at all. OK, currently we are about lo- launching a subscription model. Whereby That's customers amazing. Customers now subscribe. Like HelloFresh, all these. Do yeah. you understand? So we are trying to launch that in the next one month or thereabouts. So it will be launched. But aside that, if, the, if there's a big break, I think we'd want to consider the UK opening up in the UK or printing in the UK, you know, all of that. Because you when you look Look at it carefully. A lot of Nigerians have moved there. So we need to move with them. We need to provide what, um, you know, we just need to provide what we, they used to access here. So then we have a lot of clients that has relocated. And so it wouldn't do us any harm to <laughs> get there with them. As you have said, you always saw corporate ever going global. So yeah, yeah definitely. It is. <laughs> I love it. I love it. As we wrap up and go on to the fun random questions, what advice do you have for young entrepreneurs, particularly food entrepreneurs in Nigeria and also on the continent who are trying to pursue their passion of open, either opening up a restaurant or running a virtual kitchen? Um, I think my advice to them will be, even if you will not be the one to cook these meals, know the rudiments, know how those things are done. And because over time, as we have progressed, I feel like I have benefited more because I know how to do every single thing that goes out of our kitchen, goes in and goes out. So when a meal is bad, before it even gets to the customer, I already know that this meal is bad. I can tell of the quality of the meals. And another thing, staff can be something else. Do you understand? So I feel like none of our staff can decide one day that, okay, they want to threaten me with, okay, I'm leaving or blah, blah, blah. There is nothing you're doing that I cannot do. I just chose to, you know, outsource because there's a level you get to that you ha- you don't have to think of how the business progresses while others do the, you know, physical works. I love that. No staff can threaten me because sometimes you see some entrepreneurs and they think that doing certain tasks are beneath them or be like, this is so not for me to do. Like I'm, I'm too high up there. But you have to learn the ins and outs of the business that you're running. That is exactly what you're yeah, saying. Yeah. Okay, great. Now let's go on to the fun random questions. Are you ready? <laughs> okay. <laughs> So the first question, oh, actually, before we go into the four random questions, quickly, what can the Nigerian government do to empower food entrepreneurs and increase their chances of, of success? Okay, the first thing they should do is they should provide cash. <laughs> cash scarcity has given me so much headache through this last month. I mean, serious headaches. It's, it's so sad. I've, I've, I'm, we are like spending double. So they should please provide cash. And another thing, I want to believe that there should be a sort of support, the, the financial aid that can be provided because as much as I was able to endure through all of the phase, there are some people who do not have that endurance in them and everybody needs some form of support or the other to, to move from one stage to the other. So there should be support. The ones available are, they claim they are easily accessible, but in the real sense, they are not. Also, policies, their policies are not business friendly. 
it's like they bring in policies every day and then they expect you to just navigate your way through it so you're like every day there's there's one policy and then the next day you're finding a way to just basically it's difficult it's difficult yeah i, I think sometimes in nigeria for example a lot of people that claim to be government officials or leaders they Forget that these small businesses, a lot of times, are the lifeblood of what keeps the economy yeah. running. Like, yeah, big businesses and all these billion dollar companies, they serve their purpose, or billion naira companies, they serve their purpose. But if you ignore the small, small business. businesses. Those, the small businesses are what keeps, like, it's not everybody that has access to the billion dollar. We employ, you know, all of us, we employ, you know, we have people working with us and that is how we are able to drop the, it's not everybody that has these degrees and all of that. We keep the, the how would I call them, the less educated, we employ them and that is how we are still able to keep some of them away from crimes and all of that. Totally agree. Thank you for that insight, Adjala. <laughs> now, we're going to go into the fun random questions. I'm sure you're ready because you're drinking water to get your mouth all ready to answer. <laughs> okay, so first question is, what is your favorite meal from your corporate Ewa menu? Ikuru. No, I, I love it so much, actually. That's like, I eat it. I think, have I eaten it this morning? I think I am. <laughs> That's good. Yeah, that's, that's good. It. Okay, second question. What does integrity mean to you? Okay, integrity means being transparent. I mean, when it's when it's A, say A, even if there's a gun to your head, I know it can be difficult, but please say A. I've, I've had to deal with so much so much with people not having integrity it just makes my life difficult so please just be say the truth just say the truth nobody's going to beat you third question is what are two things people may not know about you <laughs> um i don't know but okay i think is it not known i think it's known i i used to be a very very lover a, a huge lover of mathematics like i i used to think i was going to become one professor you know taking math and all that but look at me <laughs> and i know that did so i like, like to make money actually i like to make money so you're an entrepreneur so you should <laughs> okay all right fourth question is who or what is your biggest inspiration hmm. did i say it's me they passed me i used to have someone who inspired me in the past but i saw that over time there was just a part of them that i didn't that, that wasn't suitable to me and then i saw that maybe i'm just my own inspiration like my old me when i think of the past and then compare it to the present i feel like yeah that's it for me final final question if you had the chance to jackpot from nigeria <laughs> would you take it and if yes what country would be your first choice okay i'll go to the uk <laughs> <laughs> you can't be doing corporate ever from there because you cannot come back in yourself in yeah, this country. Yeah, I feel like it's home away from home. That's like the place where you find the highest number of Nigerians aside the um, Texas, US. The UK is like home to Nigerians. So I want to go to a place where I will feel at home. So yeah, the UK for it. Okay, that's great. That's great. Now, Adiola, any final words you'd like to share before we wrap it up? Just do whatever you want to do that is legal and be consistent i feel like the price is in the consistency i remember asking you how long you started i wanted to know how long you you've come to get to this place and from there i can tell that you're willing to go as long as possible so the same thing applies to me whatever you find yourself doing just keep up at it it's that's that's what make the difference Great, great, great. And, um, for people who want to know more about Corporate Ella or possibly okay. order from you, can you share more information on how okay. they can do that? Yeah, if you want to reach out, order, do anything, just go across any of your social platform and type at Corporate Ewa. Once you search at Corporate Ewa, C-O-R-P-O-R-A-T-E-E-W-A, you find all that you need. Atiola, thank you so much for your time. Thank you too. I enjoyed the session. I'm glad. I'm really glad. Thank you to Adeola Akimala. If you enjoyed this episode, please take a few minutes to rate us on your preferred podcast platform. It helps us get discovered by more people. Thank you so much. This episode is produced, edited, and mixed by Fola Shade Anosie. The show is powered by Nonconform Productions, and our theme song is by John Akinola. You can check out the podcast on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at the SNC Podcast. Thank you for listening.